Hello and welcome to another jungle video and in this one we are once again looking at jungle differences looking at that low to mid elo compared to the best of the best the concept behind this video is to show you not only the areas of focus you need to work on in order to climb but also at how small and large mistakes cause people to lose control of games that you can easily carry. For this we will be using Nidley and that's because she's a very intense mechanical champion and also requires a lot of game knowledge in order to satisfy win conditions in every single game. As such she's a great champion to look at for all those micro mistakes that can cost you big advantages in your elo and so can provide a great window in how you can carry, win and climb by fixing all your mistakes. As always please do like, share and comment if you do enjoy these particular videos. Please consider subscribing if you view the content as worthy. Don't forget to head to the gameplay channel for more champion based content as well as full depth coaching which is linked below. And now without further hesitation let's begin. So in order to compare and contrast the best with the ever improving we have a challenger game which will be the baseline and throughout I will match the timers of a similar at least as similar as we can get it silver game. You are seeing the intro of these two games side to side with the rune comparison and I will do this while referencing the silver player's tendencies who happens to be a nidly main with 300 games a season already. As you saw runes are actually pretty solid usually we have a much bigger discrepancy with low elo runes please use u.gg look at your favorite one tricks look at challenger plays make sure your runes make sense and you are not trying to reinvent the wheel. I am much more of an electric you conquer enthusiast for the impact necessary to dominate the early and mid game. We will address this directly and understandably she went for the dark harvest for scaling but I don't really think it's that necessary. As you see her go on a weird level 1 face checking invade in search of those cheeky cash monies. I don't like this. It can very easily backfire and as you can see from another game from the same player it does. Late back to base, late to the blue buff, causes an aggro reset, a complete tragedy of the maximum scale and your whole early game is essentially ruined in terms of first pathings. You saw from our challenger player example using Nidalee's mobility to get deep vision on the blue buff which lets us know where they begin and that's significantly more valuable than trying to go for level 1 kills and what have you especially if your comps don't match up and no one's ready to do it. It also of course allows that scanner reset. And now we can start with the first clears. Max range spears of course, two autos into cougar form. And this continues while obviously receiving a leash. Now the blue buff secure seems very solid for the silver player matching the challenger player but the transition out of the blue into a fluid grunt munching is 100% showing the mechanical skill gap. There is no effort to fully kite the camp to reduce damage while positioning for a long max range spear. While doing the juicy grunt note the fluid kiting from our challenger player using the full swamp space plus actively placing traps and making sure we get that passive trigger. The inability for our silver player to transition this properly causes a huge loss in time and an unnecessary smite charge which is most notable because in the meantime the challenger Nidalee has gone to use smite on wolves to secure an extra camp and now if we compare the timers at 2 minutes 22 we see that while our silver player is ahead in terms of map positioning it's not really that far ahead and instead of being a level 3 12 CS gamer is a level 2 8 CS gamer. But why is this so crucial to your ability to carry even low elo games? Let's now instead focus on our challenger game. She transitions this time advantage into a 5 camp clear and a top lane gank. This is great because we knew the rumble started bot lane from the leash and we know that he will obviously look to do a 5 6 camp as well. Nidalee uses the scanner through the tri bush to detect any vision and of course there is some but it allows Nidalee to create pseudo pry for the crab while mildly deep warding. The fact that rumble hasn't shown indicates he's most likely on that for the 6th camp at the time as far as we know. This puts Nidalee right in front of the crab at 315 which is the point. Create prio, look to see the lane states and understand that we need to be at the objective when it spawns not afterwards. But now because Lee Sin top lane, thanks Dopa, is shilling top lane, Aurelia kind of has the pressure and prior on collapsing with the Nidalee and what you're seeing is a fight that should not have been taken. There should be respect given to their 2v2 power specifically while Zoe back before the Silas and so will be able to rotate faster, something that they were not paying attention to. And yes this does happen in Challenger as well. And as such everyone loses flash but the Nidalee doesn't die. Your first instinct here should not be our ah, bottom crab, it should be you know what we lost the coin flip I'm out of the game currently, let me flex this into Krugs, we can smite it, we can get into full HP almost and then we can repeat gank top lane knowing that one flash was burned and two I already cleared the ward. Patience waiting for a gank is crucial to a success and in this case she is waiting for Lee Sin to tie in with his return from base. The spear misses, that's fine, we can connect with multiple auto attacks just poking down, procking electrocute and then we can make sure to hit the close range spear and hit cougar form for the execute. Now we can go back to base and this is a mostly solid start and we can reset at around 4 minutes 30. Let's now swap back to our silver jungle game and see what she does in this same time frame. And briefly, 
We don't need any ignorant comments in the Twitch chat and the YouTube comments about spears missing. Challenger players hitting a spammable and hard to hit skill shot on other great players will more often miss the nut and should be almost treated like a sniper's headshot rate in an FPS, which is what I believe LEC players hit at at approximately 42%. So please understand to not make ridiculous comments about missing spears, because as you'll see from this entire video, it's not only the missing spears that determine a Nidalee skill level. And as you can see how Nidalee lost way too much time on the HP clearing red, but the great wall hopper, I think I like that, leads to a gank. However, if we freeze the frame at 305, you will see that she would have lost clearing tempo versus the enemy jungler who, as they have not shown and we know started on the bottom side, most likely would have done a 4 to 5 camp, you know, depending on if they are good or bad at clearing. Therefore, they will now have vision control over the Nidalee and the ability to set a trap. Simply walking down into the river for the crab is a terrible idea and as you can see, she tragically dies. Now, after respawning, you have seen the Kha'Zix go top crab. But instead of heading directly to the bottom crab, she does wolves first. This is incorrect. In high elo, you can easily anticipate a meta jungler trying to double scuttle you, but as Lux was pushing up and fighting the Silas in the mid at that moment, the fact that he doesn't show should now give you comfort knowing that the bottom crab can be secured, and then you can potentially look for a bottom lane gank, counter jungling, or a mid lane gank. Now she is able to secure the crab as well, so the semantics aside, watch as she goes mid lane and contrast the mechanics of ganking. The lane is in a great state, but Lux is kind of low on resources, so basically you need to go or not go. She throws one Q, a couple autos, and as such, she gets nothing. Kha'Zix notably repeats ganking top lane after taking her Krugs, and therefore she makes the right decision to go ahead and counter jungle the Kha'Zix knowing he's on the other side. Great job, but just be careful of the vision from the lane which will reveal you and shows how adept you are at wall hopping and being hyper mobile with Nidalee, that fluid gameplay. She's unnecessarily seen while counter jungling, which throws off the ability to actually go for a bottom lane gank as well, and now simply has to disengage. Because she did do the wolves, I would kind of look to do the Grump tier 2 and the tier 3 wolf camp before resetting, so that the quadrant is cleared and it gives you choices out of base. And it also ensures that you have a tier 4 wolf camp and Grump spawning at the same time the next time you're bottom side. The ability to clear fast and move around the map fast is the biggest niddly gap here, but let's compare the subsequent phase of the game to our challenger and see the differences. As you recall, we had a fight at the crab, we took the Krugs, we killed the top lane, where you can now reset, buy fast, and get back onto the map to hit the wolves. This isn't fully logical from a sequencing perspective, but it does match what the silver player did. It's simply as if she wants to hold her cars until the enemy jungler shows. She can always flex down to the grump into the bottom lane, but because mid lane dies and is low, she tries to get a cleanup kill. Zoe backs properly, and as a note, Silas will feed all starving nations in this game. Nidalee holds the wave a little bit, wall hops to the raptors, and then sequences back down to Grump. This intentionally is to throw off enemy junglers when you do it well. There's no point to really hitting the bottom crab first, because of her gank it's almost guaranteed that Rumble got that. Now I don't really agree with spaghetti pathing, you know, backtracking on yourself, but taking the raptors and then floating down to Grump, and simply shadowing the bot lane, this is kind of big because it's a little bit of a loop, throws off the enemy jungle, and it's a huge proponent of Nidley success that you can constantly farm while you're going somewhere. And obviously here she goes deep for vision to see what camps are up, which gives you tracking information and of course allows potential counter jungling with your map mobility. Now the mid lane translation gank here doesn't give us any juice, but because Rumble had nothing up on the bottom side, she knew he'd be sequencing top, and the shadows in mid lane while attempting to fall back to a blue. Just a little bit of patience in case anything happens, aha, it does. A wild rumble appears, Silas makes dying sounds, and Nidalee is there for cleanup on Haru's over aggression. He's the rumble. Now she can hold a little bit versus a fed Zoe, but not really too long, and then fall back down to the blue. This fast moving wall hopping champion allows her to activate a hugely extended sequence. Simply wall hopping, looping, being present, shadowing laners, looking for counter jungling, and instead of going back if we have full HP, and bottom lane is looking prime for some intervention. Again, make note of the autos as a crucial aspect of ganking with Nidalee, but I would also caution against such a deep dive, given that, you know, dying giving shutdowns is not very good, but you also know the rumble will be bottom side after he died mid lane after sequencing those top camps. However, the intentions are good, everything so far is part one of jungling, part two is now everything we do to make sure that by 50 minutes, we have Omega level game control, whatever that means. This really is where you lay the foundations of your carrying. Respawn, know that because you died in the face of Rumble, he'll take the RNG bot side crab and most likely dragon. This was confirmed by the Nautilus and his fat legs walking on wards. On your way to the Void Beetle, as we said, we're going somewhere. Let's hit the Raptors, make sure they spawn higher later on. Do the Herald. If we don't have help, doesn't matter. You can very easily solo it. 
Hop out, take red, take Krugs. And now ideally, yes, we'd like to gank top. Yes, we potentially want to look to use the Herald. But because your mid is super far behind, Zoe makes a play. Someone dies and you simply have to reset. This isn't a problem. It looks bad. You want to blame your laners? Don't. Safety in the face of a game swinging moment in which you simply can't 1v2 is huge. Knowing that one step back can equal two step forwards is the main aspect of carry jungling as you get into the mid game. And honestly, many players don't understand this. Like giving up the dragon and just not dying top lane. This is good. Reset, look to sequence towards the bottom lane for a herald play and eventually create their prior for the second dragon if possible. Do your walls, do your grump, nice sequencing down with peak efficiency, making sure you drag the camps. The goal is to transition this into a bottom lane gang, but just be patient, wait for them to show up, and then commit your ganking procedure. If things go well, look to hit plates, but as you know, Rumble showed top lane, Rumble is resetting to go bottom side, and Zoe will also have prior over the Silas. It's best to play it as she does. Patient, skirt the edges, heal, poke, auto. If you can hit your full combo to get a kill, do it, but don't die with your team, don't die for your team in this case, simply play it as safe and as measured as possible. At this point, there's really nothing left you can do, don't overstay, because the Nautilus and the Zoe will one-shot you, simply go back to base. Normally, you would resequence from Krugs down, that makes the most sense. Dragon will be spawning, we have time for a full clear, but because the enemy laners are attempting to take your mid lane tower defense, we can shadow that by doing raptors first, which means if they dive, if you have teammates there, you can be there if something is going to happen. If not, move on up to take your Krugs and then shadow back down. Yes, in a normal situation, 100% you go Krugs and Raptors, you do not want to double down on your prior thing, but sometimes you need to shadow an anticipated play and it's really huge to make those calculations. But again, I'm definitely more of a do the Krugs and Raptors and you'll be there anyway, and it saves you some time. Now, you can use that to float down to the bottom side if you have numbers advantage. If someone engages and you know you are fed and you can follow because you've done so many things right this game, feel free to pull the trigger, get the kills, activate the Herald, force a late TP from the enemy top laner, and then we can clear a bottom quadrant into a reset. You're watching that all unfold on your screen now and that's what makes Nidalee hard, because you have to do everything right to make sure that these past 6 and 7 minutes that we've just gone over break open the game in your favor. You have to make sure you are the leading jungler in the game. You have to make sure that when your teammates have numbers advantages, you can carry those fights and dish the damage. But we're basically setting it up so that you as the Nidley can still go ahead and carry the game to a close. We'll go over that shortly, but let's just jump back to our Sylve game to see what she does in the 7 to 15 minute mark. Now, as you recall, she did some counter jungling, resequenced the bottom side quadrant, went back to base. Now you see that Kha'Zix ganked bottom lane and had just shown presence. You should always anticipate that the jungler in this situation will be invading your blue spawn. There is a global timer and low elo junglers are like a moth to a flame with this kind of stuff. Now she ignores all of this and goes for a mid lane gank. This is noble, she gets a kill, it's clean up, that's nice, but I don't think the intention here was to gank mid lane and simply help out. She wasn't really thinking about the blue at all because as you can see, she goes straight back to it, ignores any potential vision, doesn't even consider the Kha'Zix's location, and is very lucky to survive thanks to her bottom lane and doesn't actually get the blue buff anyway. Now instead of actually taking her highest experience camps here, the wolves on the ground because she took those last, she ditches the blue quadrant to go to the red side fully. The problem with this is that she loses the ability to gain more experience, gain some resources in terms of HP and mana, and if you know that the Kha'Zix is going to fall back to his red and what have you, and you go topside, most likely he's going to go ahead and take that dragon. So if you secure those camps, you basically prevent any further counter jungling, and when that does happen, you can flex directly into that Herald. Unfortunately, as you can see, because all her time is out of whack, she didn't prioritize the right things, the Volibear top lane forces her to back, and she gets nothing. She misses out on what she could have secured. The good part is her intent to gank bottom lane here matches the challenger game of taking Wolves Grump bottom lane gank. But she doesn't consider wards, she doesn't take her scanner or use it, and she doesn't use any unique angles, or even use auto attacks, it's just a spear chuck and then disengage. Not good. She should also know that Kha'Zix is now on the top side of the map, due to exactly the same situation as the rumble in the challenger game, and could really set up some counter jungling and then look to transition that into a mid lane gank. Again, a missed opportunity. While she is able to rotate knowing the Kha'Zix is on the top side, she's able to clean up two kills from the low elo fighter on mid lane, but it does not really justify the missed farm and decisions just because you end up getting a kill. That's results based thinking. You have to make the decisions before all of this occurs. What she does is really continues doing the same thing. Farming random camps, basing at random moments, not having a clear pathing purpose around objectives, not really ganking, not tracking the enemy jungler properly. And when you have the 2v1 situation like on the top lane without challenger game, Instead of giving it up and saying, you know what, one step back, two steps forward, she fights it and once again dies. 
When you're dead, you can't have impact. She also does this later in the game with predictable pathing, walking over wards, and once again falls. At 15 minutes, she is 3-3-1 with 69 CS, no objectives, compared to our challenger who had a much worse game state, and now the game our silver player is in will be very hard to carry outside of enemy team throws. Spoiler, they did not. The Nidalee had no control, and she didn't deserve to actually win the game. You might think you have the kills and it matters, but it doesn't if you aren't actually really doing anything to manage the game win conditions. Compare that to our challenger jungler who at 15 minutes, you can see, has 105 CS, just gets her 11th kill, maybe adds a 12th and a 13th, and simply kept control of every single pathing option, slowly securing out of towers, making picks, winning the fights, and yes, yeah, she had to give up the second dragon as well to do it, but she got both heralds in return and was able to ensure her team could win the fight for that crucial third dragon and continue to set highlights for the 23 kill bomb. I have so many videos on how to close out from these points and the different situations. The raw jungling is up to around 50 minutes. After that, you're focused on closing out with macro, objective focus, rotations, and I will link various videos on different game states in the description below. But hopefully you can see it's not just your mechanics, it's not just the Miss Spears, it's how your mechanics and your decisions blend together to create a tempo advantage. That's the ultimate definition of what it means to carry. To create the ability to control the game even if the enemy has the lead. To get places first so you can be the shot caller and not have zero idea of where you want to path and why. You have to track your enemies and maintain map control over them. You have to farm on your way to where you want to be and fully clear when you are able to without giving anything away. Take your opportunities. Hopefully you can see these differences. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you're able to enjoy and learn something. Please do like, share, and comment if you did. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos coming very soon as well as on the gameplay channel. Make sure to keep those beards sequenced and fresh. And as always, I will see you all in the next tutorial.